Hi, I'm J. Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader. Thanks for joining me as we talk about another episode of the 1950s science fiction TV anthology, Tales of Tomorrow. I've written about the shows like this for magazines like Cult Movies and Starlog and Film Facts, and the Reader published an in-depth history of this story I wrote a few years back. So This episode of Tales of Tomorrow was broadcast live as it was performed on an ABC Network soundstage on June 27th, 1952 at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And uh, the seams kind of show on this episode um, kicks off on sort of a sparsely painted Martian backdrop where from time to time you can you can kind of see the, the studio lighting rigs at the corner of the corner of the sets there, particularly up there on the on upper left corner. We just got a little glimpse of the lighting rig. And uh, Leslie Nielsen is our star. He plays a spaceship captain a few years before Forbidden Planet. And he's leading a trio of explorers, including future Family Affairs star Brian Keith and William Redfield. Uh, they work for a private mining company, and they're here on Mars seeking minerals uh, that they're going to harvest for the company. A private firm that, I guess, kind of not unlike the, the contemporary films like the Alien franchise, where they're not working for the government, but uh, working for a private company. And uh, they discover... Uh, over the course of the beginning of the episode, they realize they're sitting on a, a potential gold mine, or really rather a uranium mine. And, uh, but it starts here as a party. One character actually just uh, said, uh, let's talk more beer, and they're cracking it out. And uh, It starts off with, with a real lot of uh, camaraderie, they're real friends, and uh, it's a well-scripted and well-paced and well-directed episode. Uh, in that their uh, characters really, uh, all, all three of them, go through a major arc through this uh, scant 22 minutes we're about to watch. So our longtime friends will soon find themselves infected with kind of a, a paranoia uh, that makes them begin plotting against first the, the company that they work for and, and then eventually against each other. So despite being filmed on this, this sort of barely dressed set, uh, with, with laughably low-budget spacesuits, they look kind of like janitorial wear more than uh, more than spacesuits. Appointment on Mars is really pretty engaging, especially the way their banter gradually becomes more and more sinister as they change from being space bros to being race foes. And, and you'll see, even with the sound turned down by the engineers, that even the body language and the lighting changes to reflect the shift in mood and the attitude shifts of the characters. All three actors uh, are really giving journeyman performances and makes it clear how much, uh, they, why they all enjoy such successful careers, in fact. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this fellow standing up, William Redfield. Uh, he's playing the paranoid scientist who tends to uh, kind of act like a weasel when backed into situations. W like many, if not most, scientists in Tales of Tomorrow, as we've discussed in other commentaries. Uh, William Redfield was a one-time child actor who went on to become one of the original founders of the Actors Studio. Around a year after this show aired, uh, which was in 1952, he landed a starring role in a short-lived 1953 series on the Dumont Network called Jimmy Hughes' Rookie Cop. And then in uh, 1954, uh, he starred in a, a one-season series that was... Uh, uh, called The Marriage. It was really the first live network series that was broadcast weekly in color, apparently. Uh, he was also a writer. Uh, as a writer, he co-created the Mr. Peepers series in 1952. And uh, you, you probably recognize him as Captain Bill Owens in Fantastic Voyage, the 1966 science fiction film. Uh, he's also in the original Death Wish with Charles Bronson in 1975. And uh, he plays a similar character to what we see here in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Uh, he plays Harding in that, the, uh, the logical but highly strung mental patient. And that, that's kind of his character here, as the scientist. He also starred in 83 episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater from early 1974, right up until he passed away from leukemia around a year after doing One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He passed away in August 1976. So we know a lot about Leslie Nielsen. He's playing the level-headed captain, which was a, a role that he would uh, say very successfully in a few years in, in, in uh, several other movies, but especially no, most notably Forbidden Planet. Uh, he's done a lot of similar shows previor, previous to this. He'd done a half dozen episodes uh, of a show that you mentioned a lot in these commentaries called Suspense. He's also in episodes of a show called Out There, another one called The Trap, one called The Clock, one called Sure's Fate. Uh, 
Uh, it's worth noting that he did several episodes of the radio show that uh, later turned into a TV series, Lights Out. Uh, particularly because he did a, a 1950 episode of that. It was an adaptation of a famous short story called A Child is Crying. And that same story was adapted by Tales of Tomorrow uh, in a couple of years, and it would actually be one of the all-time best episodes. And if you get a chance to play the commentary for that, uh, there's, there's actually three different ones, uh, including one from one of the producers of the program. We'll tell you a lot about behind the scenes. Uh, the well-known story for that one was by John D. McDonald. It was first published in December 1948 in Thrilling Wonder Stories, adapted in 1950 for Lights Out, and then the Tales of Tomorrow adaptation came about a year later. And all the sh versions share similarities with a short story called The Boy Who Predicted Earthquakes by Margaret St. Clair. It was published back in 1950 and was adapted later for an episode of Rod Serling's Night Gallery. So, Leslie Nielsen appeared in six Tales of Tomorrow's altogether. Uh, just a month before this one aired, he appeared as a battling scientist in one called Black Planet in May of this uh, 1952. And that one he played one of two astronomers who worked together in search of a tenth planet. Uh, uh, then they, like all scientists on this program, start to become suspicious and jealous of each other, especially once a, a hottie named Norma enters the picture and, and one of the men ends up dead and there's a, a murder mystery from there. So I singled that episode out to mention among the, uh, the ones that Lizzie Nielsen did uh, because it's one of the many Tales of Tomorrow episodes that all too obviously had a lot of live uh, broadcast errors, bloopers that made it on the air like we're going to see uh, very notably in this episode several times besides that lighting rig that uh, keeps popping up in the back and the folds in the, in, in, in the set background there. So... Uh, an actor named Horace McMahon in, in that one was playing a detective who was supposed to handcuff the hero, and he dropped the handcuffs. <laughs> and, so, and you can tell for the rest of the episode that he's, not, he's trying to fake wearing handcuffs. So Leslie Nielsen teamed up a year after this with the same director of this episode, Don Medford, who we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, they did a time travel story for Tales of Tomorrow called Another Chance, February 1953 episode. And that one features Nielsen in a very Serling-esque tale, uh, directed by Don Medford that features a regretful criminal who gets a chance to live part of his life over again, thanks to answering a newspaper ad that reads, quote, I can help you, unquote. And uh, he ends up landing back in 1946 in a new city with a new name, but unfortunately he's lost the memory of his previous life, including the woman whose love he was hoping to regain, and that's, that's really just one of the problems he has to face in that episode. Uh, Lizzie Nielsen turns up also in the Ghost Rider episode that was in March 1953. Plays an aspiring wordsmith whose stories uh, seem to be coming true, which is uh, reminiscent of Twilight Zone's Printer's Devil episode. And uh, that one spiced up with several sly twists courtesy of scripter Man Rubin, who we talk about in a lot of these uh, commentaries as well. So Brian Keith here in the foreground. Um, most of us recognize, of course, from the, uh, being the dad in the original Parent Trap, and if you don't know him from that, you probably remember him uh, as the genial uh, uncle, Uncle Bill, I guess it was, on Family Affair. Uh, but he'd done a lot of TV anthologies before this. He'd done a lot of genre shows similar to this one. Did Hands of Mystery. Did one called Shadow of the Cloak. Did at least a half dozen episodes of that program Suspense that we reference so often. Uh, he and Leslie Nielsen actually would appear together in another Tales of Tomorrow. They did a two-part adaptation of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And in that one, Brian Keith kind of pretty much plays the same kind of role you see here. He's the, the soldier, the jock, the kind of uh, thick-headed, uh, lunk-headed, uh, you know, two-fisted beer drinker. That one, uh, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, was also directed by the same fellow who did this one, Don Medford. And uh, Lizzie Nielsen in that one, he actually plays Captain Nemo's prisoner, Farragut. That one was in, uh, aired in late January and then early February, part two, 1952. And the Tales of Tomorrow version actually debuted two years before the Disney epic, although the story had already provided the basis for a, a 1907 film short by French fantasy filmmaker Georges Millier. And uh, there was also a 1916 feature film. And uh, also, I looked up and I found out there was a 1947 episode of the 1947 uh, episode, rather, of the NBC radio series Favorite Story. I wasn't aware of that at all. But let's talk a little bit about the writer. He's, he's very interesting. His writer was S.A. Lombino, Salvatore Albert Lombino. And you may be familiar with him under the name Evan Hunter, the creator of the Ed McBain novels that began in 1955. 
The Ed, Ed McBain police procedural novels were published between 1956 and all the way up through about 2005 with uh, over 50, I think maybe 55 books in this series. Lombina wrote the novel on which the film Blackboard Jungle was based, and uh, this appointment on Mars was actually his first story that was produced for film or television. And as far as I know, it, it remains his only science fiction script for either medium, although he wrote a lot of science fiction stories for, for books and magazines under uh, several different pseudonyms. Lombino got to start the previous year, about 1951, working as an executive producer for the Scott Meredith Literary Agency. And there he worked with authors like Paul Anderson and Arthur C. Clarke, both of whom were among the original 12 writers that formed Tales of Tomorrow's Science Fiction League of America. Also worked with authors like Lester Del Rey, Richard S. Prather, P.G. Woodhouse. He made his first professional story sale that same year, 1951. It was a science fiction story called Welcome Martians. And that was published under his real name, S.A. Lombino. By the time this episode aired in the summer of 1952, he'd had around a half dozen published credits, including stories like Fury on First, which was a sports story he did under his Hunt Collins pseudonym. He'd written one called Reaching for the Moon for Science Fiction Quarterly. I think that was under his real name, S.A. Lombino. Uh, he'd already had a couple of novels under his Evan Hunter pseudonym, uh, one called The Evil Sleep. And uh, he'd also had written a, a sci-fi novel for kids called Find the Feather Serpent in 1952. He used his real name for a, a story called Silent Partner in Science Fiction Quarterly. That ran in August 1952, although that was actually later reprinted as an Evan Hunter story. And uh, he'd also had a couple of detective stories published before this, or by the time this aired as well. I think under his Hunt Collins pseudonym, uh, one called Dead Freight and another one called The Body Beautiful. And uh, our director that we mentioned a couple times, Don Medford, he did around 35 episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. And considering there's 85 episodes total, uh, that, that's a pretty uh, large share. He was just kicking off a career back then that would find him script scripting around 100 TV shows including five episodes of The Twilight Zone. He did Alfred Hitchcock Presents, did the final episode of The Fugitive, and also did three dozen episodes of the FBI, a couple dozen Berettas, Dynasty, Mrs. Columbo, Airwolf, and uh, even occasionally scripted and produced some of the shows he worked on. His Twilight Zones are the ones that would probably most remind you of uh, his Tales for Tomorrow work. He directed A Passage for Trumpet with Jack Klugman. That was... Uh, he did the Genie episode, Man in a Bottle. Uh, he did The Mirror with Peter Falk. Did Death's Head Revisited with the Concentration Camp. And he did one of the hour-long episodes, Death Ship, from 1963. And some of his films include, uh, there's a full-length version of the Man from Uncle series called To Trap a Spy. He directed that. And he did the third entry in Sidney Poitier's Mr. Tibbs trilogy, The Organization. When I interviewed uh, producer Man Rubin, he singled out Don Medford as one of the most welcoming directors. And I'll read you a quote from that. He said, quote, he was very good, he was always very visual, and he would plan out the concepts to move the cameras. I always felt very secure with him, and he knew exactly what to do with the scripts. There were other directors that didn't really want you around, unquote. Don Medford actually lived to be the age of 95. He passed away in early 2013. And... Uh, Don Medford did some really good episodes that we talk about in other commentaries. He did one of the best of the uh, Desert Island uh, horror shows, The Dune Roller. Did a really good jungle-based episode uh, that was written by Frank DeFolita, who later became known for Audrey Rose, and that was called The Fatal Flower. Did a real good one called The World of Water, about a scientist who uh, gets so upset over losing his girlfriend that he creates a universal solvent that transforms all matter it comes into contact with into water which pretty much sets off the end of the world. And uh, Don Medford also did uh, The Invader, uh, which is another one that doesn't portray scientists very flatteringly, uh, as well as Youth on Tap, which is pretty much what the, what the title describes, a scientist that goes around sucking youth out of people in order to live longer himself. You can find out a lot more about Don Medford and how he made the transition from live TV broadcast to videotape by looking up a master thesis that's online that was written by his son, Jeffrey Wright. Uh, he actually later turned, teamed up with Mel Goldberg, Don Medford again, worked together uh, on an Untouchables-style TV show in 1953 called Treasury Men of Action. And they got together for an episode called The Case of the Old and the Frightened. 
And Mel Goldberg and Don Medford teamed up yet again for a 1955 episode of General Electric Theater, hosted by Ronald Reagan. And that one, Mel Goldberg adapted The Return of Gentleman Jim for an episode starring George Montgomery. So we can see here in the episode that they're, they're getting more and more uh, suspicious of each other. Uh, and for some reason or other, well, the captain wants to take away their guns, and you'll note that they're using just regular pistols here in outer space. They don't have ray guns or anything like that. I'm not sure if that's a, a nod towards uh, realism or just laziness there. But uh, he's trying to get them to leave, to leave their guns with him because they've already accused each other of whispering in each other's ear and, 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 and just doing creepy things. And, uh, and, of course, Leslie Nielsen is still being the level-headed guy. Very well scripted, though, and, and, and kind of just watching the body language here, too. You can kind of tell exactly what's happening, even with, with the sound turned down. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the program background. We, we rarely ever get to talk about the actual origin of the series. It was originally planned to be called Tomorrow is Yours. And it can be traced back to an idea by science fiction author Theodore Sturgeon. He provided the story for the very first episode. And he teamed up with TV producer Mort Abrahams. Uh, Abrahams would later go on to do shows like Route 66, The Man from Uncle, uh, and probably be best known for doing movies like Goodbye Mr. Chips, uh, Dr. Doolittle, and he did the first two films in the Planet of the Apes franchise. And uh, producer Mort Abrahams got his start in TV producing Tom Corbett's Space Cadet. Uh, in 1950, and he'd later go on to work on shows like Route 66, The Man from Uncle. Um, among the writers for the show, I'd like to mention a few of those because, I mean, we had 12 uh, authors that started off as the Science Fiction League of America. It was really just a coalition that agreed to pool their stories together for the series. And, uh, and they included Arthur C. Clarke, C.M. Cornblues, Stanley Jean Weinbaum, Frederick Brown. And, uh, and there were also some adaptations of classic stories by the likes of H.G. Wells. I mentioned uh, that Jules Verne adaptation, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, they adapted an Oscar Wilde story. They did the picture of Dorian Gray. And uh, we have a lot of commentaries on the episode that they adapted of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein starring Lon Chaney Jr. Among the other writers whose work was up for grabs was Robert Heinlein, Frederick Pohl, Philip Wiley, Henry Kuttner, John Campbell, Ray Bradbury, and A.E. Van Vaugh. I mean, it was a stellar, stellar lineup. So the soundtracks for this series were mostly cobbled together from the, uh, from the network library, uh, usually stock music and uh, sometimes with accompanied by organ music that was kind of a holdover from the old uh, soap opera days, the old radio show days, a little, little histrionic and a little overdramatic at times. Uh, according to uh, show creator, co-creator Mort Abrams, though, one of the guys who uh, selected the music and spun the records was Jerry Goldsmith, who was then 21 years old. And uh, he'd go on to, he took a job with CBS, and he later scored for genre features like Planet of the Apes, Logan's Run, Alien, uh, Total Recall, The Omen, uh, as well as several films in the Star Trek franchise. And uh, as we get near the ending here, you see... Uh, Redfield's getting paranoid, firing off his gun. The, what, what, the twist ending that they're putting forth here is that these native Martians have got inside the astronauts' heads and is turning them against each other, making them paranoid, first against the company, then each other. And, of course, that's reminiscent of uh, stories like uh, there's one in Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles. Uh, it's also like the end of the, uh, the Monsters Who Do on Maple Street from Twilight Zone. Or, or even that two-headed alien in Mr. Dingle the Strong from Twilight Zone. Cause could, that's also just messing with, uh, with humans and putting ideas in their heads and doing things to them and seeing how they react is, uh, is just sort of testing, is using us as guinea pigs. So the meddling here, of course, isn't to that comic effect. They, they've made them uh, so paranoid that one of them has now shot the other one. And uh, Captain is trying to say, well, of course, you know, he came after me. It was self-defense, but... Uh, Keith, Brian Keith here is convinced that no, it was planned all along, and this guy wants all the uranium money for himself. And uh, so, uh, so the aliens have definitely succeeded uh, in, in, in doing what they said to do and making them paranoid against each other. And it's really interesting because on this show, we, we don't actually see aliens too often. The few times we do, uh, they, they're either indifferent to mankind or they really want to mess with us. They seem to test us quite a bit. It's a very recurring theme from several different writers. And uh, as we get near the ending here, uh, keep an eye out for, uh, it, it's going to deviate a little bit from the script. 
you, you'll, you'll see a little while back, uh, one, one of them used a gun. Uh, if, if you haven't been keeping close eye on what happened to that gun, unfortunately, neither have these guys. The, the end of the script requires them to end this episode with a gunfight. And uh, this was broadcast live as it was performed. So uh, things had to be timed exactly so that, you know, you ended right on the commercial breaks. In the case of Tales of Tomorrow, there was always one in the middle. Uh, and you had to time your, your storyline so that, and your line reading so that the show ended when the show ends, which is, you know, at a set second and moment in time. <laughs> so we got one guy here as a gun. Brian Keith, and uh, I'm not sure whether or not Leslie Nielsen is realizing at this point that his prop gun is no longer <laughs> where he needs to be on his hip in order them for to have this final scene. So uh, what, what ends up happening is it ends up being totally improvised by the actors. I'll read you what Mort Abraham said. He said, quote, what happened at the end of the show is that Leslie Nielsen was supposed to pull a gun on Keith, but the gun fell out of his holster, so he didn't have a gun. I stood, I'm sure, pale and shaking in the control room with the director. And I remember Don Menford and I looked at each other, our hearts in our mouths, wondering how this thing was going to end. Being consummate professionals, they simply went after each other, hand to hand, which wasn't in the script at all, and remarkably ended their fight in a mutual death, exactly when the program should have ended. Unquote. And holy cow, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if they're actually watching the director, you know, count down the seconds they got to make this last, but I read you one more quote from Ward Abrams about this. He said, quote, the writer of that show, S.A. Lambito, he called me the next day and he said, gee, I don't know why you changed the ending of my play, but your ending was much better, unquote. <laughs> uh, and it certainly was more physical, wasn't it? absolutely terrific and look at the way the camera pans down back and we're going to actually pull back into kind of an overhead shot that you know if you just don't look too closely at the edges of the set and the scenes that show and the lighting rigs and the folds and the backdrop that's a pretty ambitious shot for live television don't you think this this is a wonderful episode of tales of tomorrow we're not going to get to see the commercial unfortunately which would be the closest thing to a, a happy ending that one ever seen on an episode of tales of tomorrow but we did get to see a terrific episode and a terrific performance by our three main actors here. And, uh, and keep in mind also that we, we didn't get to hear the actual uh, sounds of the thing, but they had the wind whipping up all the way through it, as well as that lighting shift all the way through it as it got darker and darker and they got more and more suspicious of each other. I, I would say I would rank this as among the top 10 best episodes of Tales of Tomorrow, and I would even go a little further. I would say it ranks up there among some of, anyways, the best of the Twilight Zones and Boris Karloff thrillers that we all enjoy so much. I hope you enjoyed watching it with me. I sure enjoy talking about it with you. Come back again soon.